Welcome to the Cinepax Podcast. I'm your host, Tyler Casey, and this is episode 35. In this episode, I sit down and talk with a very popular director, Nicholas Jandora, who's directed videos for Lil Skies, Young Pinch, Lil Nar, and artists like 24K Golden. Jandora came up working with Lil Skies and shot some really popular videos that helped Skies pop off, like the video Lettuce Sandwich. He recently did a super popular video for the song Roxanne by Arizona, We talk all about this in this episode. There's tons of value in this. He gives tons of tips for upcoming music video directors. Definitely a lot of great value in this episode. So if you do enjoy it, please give us a review on iTunes or wherever you consume your podcast content. If you guys do want to watch the episode, make sure to click the show notes. You can download the episode, listen to it on multiple platforms, and watch it all on our website. We don't have a sponsor for this podcast, so make sure to check out Cinepax, download our free effects, and purchase them if you like them. Here's episode 35 with Nicholas Jandora. I hope you guys enjoy it. What's up, guys, and welcome to the Cinepax podcast today. We have a very special guest on today, Nicholas Jandora. How you doing, Nick? Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? What's up, man? So how you been during all this uh, quarantine stuff? Uh, I've been good. It hasn't really been much different because, I mean, I'm pretty shut in normally. Yeah. Like, it's in, like, I don't really go out too much, but... um. No, it, it's it's definitely been weird just like not being able to do like full shoots and stuff yeah so how have you been kind of been how have you been dealing with that uh have you basically been um just doing like stripped down crews and whatnot like smaller down uh smaller crews like when going out and shooting yeah pretty much um <clears throat> so pretty much all the labels require you to have like less than 10 people total that's like including artists and like their crew so normally uh the past three that i've done it's been like a five person crew gotcha so the artists will probably want to bring a handful of people as well uh yeah the the last couple ones that we've done is pretty much just been the artist and their manager though it hasn't really been like a big crew or anything yeah it's pretty crazy yeah uh that last video you did uh i forgot the name of it but i had all those crazy like uh analog tv stuff and all those glitchy vhs edits that was was that one of the stripped down crews during uh looked like you shot it during the coronavirus yeah so that was a uh, that was ty fontaine uh mm-hmm. for his song moments and i think the crew was i'm pretty sure it was five or less it was me uh my dp brett an ac a gaffer and a producer so yeah five people and then it was sure. him and his manager Gotcha. Well, yeah, it still came out fire, even with some limitations of crew and whatnot. So, yeah, it looked dope. Thank you, man. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else you've been working on lately? Um, any big projects in the work or anything that you've been up to? Um, so I have another one uh, with Audrey Mika coming up next week. And then I have um, – most of it's just, like, writing stuff and nothing's, like, locked in yet just because sure. labels feel like – super sketched about um gotcha. doing videos and just getting yeah. it past their legal team that's that's the main thing like they just them. don't want anything to like fall back on them or something like that with yeah or just like a shoot get canceled and then them waste all that money yeah for sure just, yeah. the yeah. last one you did for her was pretty cool the one with uh kyle i like all those like retro graphics and uh just kind of like the style of that one i was just watching it it's pretty sick yeah thank you man yeah it's cool so i've heard you mention uh Tell me a little bit about like the start. So you grew up in West Virginia. Um, Tell me just like a quick gist of like how you kind of got into shooting videos and what that was kind of like. Um, so yeah, I grew up in Martinsburg, West Virginia. Uh, and I, as a kid, I always did like kind of like run and gun, like filming, like just random videos with like my friends and like my neighbor and my brother. That was when I was like in grade school and we would like make these like horror movies and shit. Mm-hmm. And then uh, <clears throat> as I got into uh, high school, I started doing uh, like a sketch comedy type videos on uh, YouTube. So I started a YouTube channel and then uh, that kind of started growing a little bit. And I was like known in my town as like the YouTube kid. And then uh, as I got to college, 
I just had friends and uh, random people that I knew that would be like, yo, I need a music video. Have you ever done that? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I can try. And then eventually just started doing like running gun music videos uh, for like local people. Yeah. Then linked up with Skies and then that kind of uh, skyrocketed kind of sure. the, pro- the progression. And then, uh, yeah, pretty much just met with bigger artists after doing stuff with Skies and like being with Skies for a minute. And then uh, labels started hitting me up and then it kind of just snowballed from there. Yeah. So definitely like linking up with Skies definitely like helped bring all the other artists around because like I can even see like what uh, I was watching the one video with uh the one that you did with little skies and young pinch um i can't remember the name of all these videos even the videos i shoot i can't remember the i names of. think it was uh i know you it might have been i know you oh with- yeah, yeah it was that one yeah with the crazy like glitchy edits as well um but it's just interesting to see that and then you go on and do like four or five other videos with young pinch by himself um one thing that i've heard you mention in other podcasts is uh you said you didn't want to get stuck in your hometown because you said it was just kind of easy to get kind of like that classic like hometown story like where you don't want to get stuck there um what were some of the things that um helped push you to get out of your hometown and really um just get out there uh to la and start making more videos and make making bigger moves um so it's kind of a combination of a lot of things. So I had just graduated college. Uh, I got a degree in visual journalism. And it was just like a bunch of people, like my teachers and my my parents and kind of my girlfriend at the time were kind of pushing me like, all right, take like a an internship at these places. Cause I got offered a, a couple internships at like news places, but I just, I didn't really want to do that. I was like, I know that I'm going to get, I don't want to work for free to work at a place that I don't want to work at. So like, why would I waste all that time and and effort? And I would have to live in DC and DC is super expensive. And I just wasn't, when I graduated, I was kind of like lost for like a year. There was like a, Mm -hmm. because I had shot Sky's video like two months before I graduated. It was when I first met Sky's and like he came to my house and we shot a video at my crib. And uh, so, like, from that year, he was still, like, graduating uh, high school. So he graduated high school, started his first year of college, um, and then basically dropped out his after his first semester just because Mm -hmm. his music started picking up. But, yeah, I came to the point where it was, like, Skies was starting to get bigger. The, The work in Martinsburg and the surrounding area just wasn't, wasn't worth it and i was like i know that either new york or la is the spot to be and i had done a few videos in new york and it kind of like threw me off of new york made me not really want to live there just because it was so busy and i'm just not a huge like uh city guy gotcha so uh basically i got rolling loud so i got picked up to be rolling uh like do media for rolling loud Mm -hmm. and uh like right after that my girl broke up with me, so I didn't really have any like ties back in West Virginia. So I was like, yeah. oh, fuck it. I'm just going to pack all my stuff up and go to L.A. So that's pretty much what I did. Sure. I just packed all my stuff up and then uh, just drove out to L.A. and slept on couches and mm-hmm. shitty hotels and Airbnbs and stuff like that. Yeah. And that having like, you know, not much moving out here, was that definitely like motivation to continue to work hard? Um, because I've also heard in other podcasts that like money wasn't really like your motivation. It was really just to like kind of survive and do what you like doing. Um, Yeah, it was, um, it was like definitely the darkest and some of like the brightest times of my life, just because I was, I was definitely struggling. Like I had no money to my name, but I was still happy because I was like, you know, I'm out in LA. Like, yeah, even if I don't have any money, I'm still out in LA, like doing what I want to do. But uh, I think just LA being so expensive and like you have to be on your shit yeah, or you're not going to have a place to sleep. That was kind of like, all right, I really need to like start grinding and like just do a bunch of work. But um, yeah, yeah, it, it worked out. It was definitely motivation though. Like there's uh, definitely a lot of people who go out there 
and don't make it and get sent right back home and kind of just get stuck in that same cycle. So there's so many people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that was the, that was the last thing I was, I, I wanted to do. I was like, yeah. I cannot, I cannot go back home. No. Yeah. That, hey. that probably wouldn't be too fun either. Just like, especially like, you know, your parents or, you know, it just, and just going back to the same people that you were kind of growing up with, you know, it might not be, you know, like, especially like, um, yeah, I don't know. Like when the like I remember when I was graduating from high school, people are like, "Don't go to community college because you're gonna go with the same kids you went to high school with." You know, there was always that little spiel. So, um, for sure. But uh, one thing that I thought was interesting, how you said you did uh, shot horror films as a kid, you did uh, comedy sketches. It's kind of interesting how you can kind of see some of those elements in your videos today. Do you feel like you still kind of uh, mix those in there? Yeah, I I, I feel like I I definitely do. And try to have like a uh, a wide range, so I'm not locked into like a specific style. So mm -hmm. um, I can do like almost any song, yeah, and make it look different. So that that's the main thing. Like as, as far as a style, it's like I don't even know if I have one, just because I try to like make each video styled to that song specifically. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I definitely think the er like just me watching like horror movies and making horror movies and comedy sketches definitely um overlapped into into what i do now for sure yeah um that's one thing i've been following you i don't know how long i've been following you maybe quite a few years but one thing i've noticed is how far your styles came like uh, definitely in the beginning, it kind of looked more of like glitchy type edits. Um, some of like the popular edits at the time, you know, like the sky replacement stuff, all that. But then it mm -hmm. definitely like matured and progressed. Uh, tell me a little bit about that process, which kind of like, um, yeah, I don't know, just like how your styles changed over the years. What do you think has accounted for that? Um, honestly, I think the the main reason is just because there's so many videos and. Uh, so many just directors and so many people putting out content that you want your stuff to to stand out. Um, so when I first started doing the run and gun stuff, um, so I, I normally edit solely on uh, Final Cut Pro. Mm -hmm. So there's there's limitations to that. You can only do so much. So like I would do like sky replacement would be easy. Um, some of the glitchy stuff would be kind of on the simpler side. But as I kind of like get got bigger budgets or just started doing more videos i realized like i'm i really need to like change it up and like have more of a a story driven video with if, if, and if i do use effects make them drive the story rather than just like oh here's just effects just to have effects yeah but I, it, it, it it's, it's a lot of just like studying um music videos studying film reading scripts it, it's all just like a learning process because um i didn't really go to school i went to school for journalism but it didn't really teach me any of the stuff that i use now mm -hmm. it, it helped a little bit with writing and like structure but all the other stuff is kind of just like you have to either do it just to learn it or just kind of research it on online yeah yeah um it's cool i like what you said about if you're going to use like an effect or a specific effect and even like with us like selling effects online and like creating these presets for people we definitely see the best videos is when someone you know plans a video and actually uses that effect like even if like you see a cool effect and you apply it to like your story or you make it a part of the story i definitely think um that is the best one of the best ways to sell it um so is that yeah. What kind of helped you make the transition from the run and gun phase? Because I think it was probably not too long ago, maybe like two years ago, I saw you just like running around with like an A6500 or something, uh, just yeah. shooting music videos. And then all of a sudden things just kind of switched up. You're doing these huge videos for Little Skies and whatnot. And some of them are still seem kind of run and gun, but they mm -hmm. definitely had a more polished uh, look to it. I mean, a lot of that uh, just stems from bigger budgets. So um, I think Lettuce Sandwich and Lust were two like kind of uh, turning points where I was like, realized people enjoy more story structure and more like just rather than just run and gun random shots, they want something that they can like run back and like actually tell the story. So, um, but both of those were shot with 
Sony's mm -hmm. too. And then uh, as it kind of just like started picking up, uh, I was able to get like bigger crews and start working with like DPs and actually get like legit lighting people and rent locations. Yeah. So uh, I think just having more money gave me more creative freedom to like actually get what I wanted to do uh, like across because I would write like crazy treatments and then they'd be like, oh, we only have like $2,000. And yeah. I'd be like, I can't do any of this. So I kind of, a lot of it is just like working with what you have. And I feel like uh, a lot, especially now it's, it's the best time to do that because like anyone has access to like editing programs or computers and, and, and cameras and, and you can make stuff look really clean for, uh, for pretty cheap as long as you have a good idea behind it. Yeah. So yeah, do you think, uh, what would your advice be for someone trying to level up from like that run and gun production level who's just out here, you know, kind of more of like a videographer more than a director? What would you suggest for them to like kind of make that transition from videographer, uh, which maybe you kind of did into more of a director? What, what do you, you know? It's honestly like, <clears throat> it's, it's just all about your content like if you have good content <clears throat> and people can see that like all right if we give this guy some money he can actually like really create something cool and i think uh i think as long as you have like a mindset where you're like i want to create stories and i want to like level up you will level up mm -hmm. and if you're just like oh i can just shoot run and gun and I can edit in a day and then have it out. And then like, that's what I do. And, and, and there's a lane for that. There's, there's mm -hmm. people that do that and make really good money, but it's, I don't know. It's, it's tough. It's just cause I'm still like in the process of like learning all this stuff. Like I'm still pretty young and like still pretty new to like the, uh, the industry and stuff. Yeah. And there's still things that I learn like every day, but uh, I would just say like, just create good content always work keep good relationships with the artists that you have um don't be afraid to work for free but also don't be afraid to like put your foot down and be like no like you need to pay me for this mm -hmm. it, it's it's all just like a very like walking on eggshells kind of thing where it's like you have to like know your worth but also like be humble at times and like not be like have an ego and be like oh i'm like too good for this because yeah. if there's there's been plenty of videos that have no budget where i'm like oh like i i deserve more than this but then i think and i'm like i mean i'm i'm doing what i i want to do for a living like money shouldn't be an issue if i like the song and i have a good idea i would rather create that than have a couple extra thousand dollars in my pocket because mm -hmm. your your work is what's gonna like people are gonna see like that a good video will make you 10 times more money than like a a, a shitty video that you get paid a, a good amount of money for so it's like mostly the long run you got to like look at it from yeah. a bigger picture where do you want like this medium bag now or do you want like a steady influx of medium bags mm -hmm. Yeah, and I that's something I try and I've said before on this podcast as well is um especially that I've done myself that I've seen really beneficial is I'm sure you've probably done this as well. You get like a budget, especially when like starting out, when you get that first two, three, whatever, five thousand dollar budget, is reinvest that back in not paying yourself or taking a lower rate. Is that something you've done personally and believe in or Oh yeah, that's that's still something um, I do today. So pretty much, the main thing that I try to do as a director is um, just treat my crew correctly. Um, so I always make sure that they're getting paid properly. I'll never be like, oh, I'm getting five thousand for this video, and like a PA is getting a hundred dollars. I'm like, nah, that's that's not cool. Like yeah. stuff like that. It's like just because in the in the video shit and when you're on set <clears throat> every single person is necessary and kind of the vibe of the director kind of determines the vibe of the entire set so if you're like an asshole director like people are going to kind of like have that 
energy mm-hmm. and then that kind of folk or like goes onto the video or goes onto the artist and it's just not a fun time yeah um but yeah even like when we when we create budgets i know i normally have like kind of a fixed rate so even if it's like uh like a forty thousand dollar video or a like ten thousand dollar video sometimes i'll take around the same rate um even if it's lower just because i want to put as much as i can into the video and even if there's there's been times where we're like oh we're over budget by like this amount or this amount i'm, I'm usually just like yo just take it out of my rate because yeah. i don't want to take it out of any of the cruise rates because like the the video doesn't fall back on them mm-hmm. like the video at the end of the day it falls on the director so it's like if there's any like money or anything that like kind of like shitty thing that has to happen i would rather it happen to me than happen to like one of my crew members and then them kind of like have this like anger towards me where they're not gonna like want to work with me again just because i like did some shitty stuff yeah and it's just like in the video shit there's so many favors that need to be pulled when we like do small budget videos where i'm like yo can you help me out exactly for like a lower rate so if, if you're if you're a nice dude and and treat people like actual people then it it definitely uh helps just creating shit and just in in general just the vibe of the of the set no yeah i think that definitely goes a long way in just coming back around um so one thing i wanted to talk about a little bit about is you recently directed the very popular song roxanne for uh arizona so tell me a little bit about that about uh how the project came up how you started coming up with the ideas for that um because yeah it popped off quite a bit last i think i looked it was over 100 million um i think so yeah so yeah um so i knew arizona so he uh actually went i don't know if he went to school where i went to school uh but he was there he like lived there Mm -hmm. so he uh it's called morgantown west virginia it's where uh, west virginia university is so i kind of knew of him from there and then when i came out to la um my roommate now neek uh who's like sky's audio engineer okay he was uh living in a house with arizona and that was like actually like one of the houses that i would uh crash at so i would like sleep on their stu- uh in their studio like on their couch and shit and uh yeah basically met arizona from that and then it was kind of before he uh popped off or anything and then once roxanne popped off he uh hit me up for the video and kind of because he had a bunch of choices but he was he was trying to keep it because he he hasn't had a video before that and he's not really a, a social media or any kind of like internet kind of person he doesn't really fuck with uh stuff like that so he didn't want to do like the typical like oh industry video director yeah. he he wanted his vision to get across so uh, i feel like he wanted to say like he knew that i would interpret his vision correctly yeah. and like actually get what he wanted across so uh he had the idea of the groundhog's day kind of thing where it's like a day repeating over and over again uh so he's like yeah i want to do that i kind of like the style of uh once upon a time in hollywood and then once i heard that i was like okay yeah we can do a bunch of stuff with that and then i kind of built off that and then uh with the once upon a time in hollywood i kind of based the style off that but then uh i also did a lot of uh pulp fiction references Mm -hmm. in the diner and uh yeah, it was it was definitely a collaborative effort. Like he knew the look that he wanted for the girl. He was like, I want her to look like Uma Thurman in Pulp Fiction. I want her to have like Bob. <clears throat> I was like, okay, bet. And it was uh, yeah, he was definitely like a uh, part of the creative process through the entire thing. And then when we were shooting, it was just like a huge crew. First time I've ever worked with like a Damn. really like legit legit budget. Um, but yeah, it was it wasn't much different than my other shoots it was just more people and more Mm -hmm. resources but it was uh it was definitely cool because all the uh all his friends like i've I've known and like hang out with and i'm friends with so it was it was definitely just like a fun shoot overall it was long but it was it was fun yeah that's cool yeah that's interesting you say he's not much of like a social media guy and then the song kind of like pops off on like tiktok like that and um what's it called did you feel 
a, a little bit more pressure because of how popular the song was? Did you feel like there was a little bit of weight writing on it? Or since you kind of already knew him um, and were kind of associated, you kind of, it was just kind of like. No, I, I, I definitely felt pressure um, just because Arizona is a very selective person. Like he knows what he wants and yeah. like he, he won't be afraid to like tell you. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that I like <clears throat> got his vision across and like was he was happy with the video because like that was like his big song. Mm-hmm. And it was like one of his first, or not one of his first, but one of his like first videos as like an, the artist that he is now. Um, so I definitely wanted to just like stay true and like make sure that he was happy with the video. So that was that was the most pressure. And then I think just like the bigger budget was very like yeah um, unnerving, just because I'm like, yo, I can't, I can't fuck this bag up. Yeah. Like I, I gotta make sure that this video is uh, good, but. I think the popularity of the song didn't really intimidate me. I think that yeah. like was more of a motivator of of like, oh, a lot of people are gonna see this, so I want to make sure that it looks good. But it, oh, that yeah. that didn't really like sketch me out. I think it was just like making sure that he was happy with the video. That was my main concern. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's cool. I like uh, definitely like the rewatchability of it. I think it's really good for like the the popularity of the song. So people, you know, it has so much in it within like. I don't know how long it is like three minutes that you definitely like want to watch it again um i think yeah just everything about it i like the groundhog's day aspect especially like with all like the graphic matches and the transitions of falling back into the bed were pretty fire so yeah you thank definitely you, killed the video i think it was sick thank you man for sure um yeah i got some other questions here and then i'll get into a, a bunch of people ask you questions so i'll get into a handful of those so let's say someone approaches you with a song that you're not really into Mm-hmm. How do you, uh, you kind of touched on it earlier that you usually probably don't really um, you're more into like having a song that you like and that you're passionate about so how do you kind of go about like if a label pitch wants you to do a song or something like that how would you go about not doing it if I don't know um, so I, I try to be as honest as possible um, just so I, I don't waste the label's time and I don't do a, uh, a disservice to the artist so if i'm not a real fan of the song i would say like 99 percent of the time i'm gonna be like yo i'm gonna ha- i'm gonna pass on this i'm not really like, like vibing with it it's not my style or i'm just having trouble coming up with um an idea for it mm-hmm. but my, my main thing is like i don't want to just take a video just to get the the bread if i don't like the song yeah because like what happens if a director really really likes that song and i get the job over him and he would have created a, a 10 times better video yeah i mean it's all about the artists at the end of the day i want to make sure that they have something that they're 100 percent proud of and that i'm 100 percent proud of so i don't want to like take a job just to get the money and then the artists not get what they need for their for the for the video yeah. So I definitely I I try to be as polite as possible and like tell them straight up like yeah it's just not my vibe or um, I'm just not really a fan of the song. I like um, that. But I I even tell that to artists sometimes I'm like song is dope but it's just like for a video it's just not not for me man. Yeah, for sure. I think that's a pretty good way to go about it. Um, especially instead, I mean, in the beginning you might kind of have to take. Some oh yeah, I, I had to I had to take a bunch of <laughs> yeah. stuff that I wasn't a fan of for, for super sure. cheap, but I still tried to create something good. It's just when you're editing, it's just if it's a song that you don't like, oh man, yeah. it can be especially tortured. editing. Yeah, yeah, especially yeah, it's crazy. You still, uh, you do a lot of editing. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I try so to I try to edit it. pretty much all of my stuff, um, unless it's like obviously like the crazy vfx stuff um i hire people for but as far as like base edit and story structure i i usually try to uh do that myself just because it's a lot of my videos don't require too much vfx and it's all kind of based on the story structure and it's just so hard to explain what your vision is to somebody else and then them try to like interpret that so I just try to keep it easy and For just sure. do it all myself yeah. and just have more creative control. So 
you talked briefly about uh, you worked with Arizona on the idea for that video. How does mm-hmm. how does it usually work with um, when a label or an artist hits you up to shoot a video that they want to work with you on and the creative process behind that of creating a treatment? Uh, do you usually work with the artist or how does that usually go? Uh, it, it could all depend. Um, some artists are more involved. Yeah. Uh, sometimes if I get sent a brief, um, to write on a treatment, it'll usually be like, uh, treatment needed this day. This is the song. Um, this is the budget. And then occasionally they're like, all right, this is what the artist like wants to replicate. Like here's references or here's stuff like that. Um, sometimes that's helpful. Sometimes it's not, Hmm. uh, because a lot of times I'll have like a completely different idea when I hear the song than what they want to create. And a lot of times, um, labels and artists kind of like base what they want it to look like off of other music videos. And I, I, I'm not a huge fan of that just because like copying someone's style isn't, isn't that, um, it's, it's pretty much looked down upon. So I try to like do something different. Um, but when I, when I write, there's some artists that I have FaceTime calls with and I'm like, all right, uh, I, I want to see like what your vision is, what your vibe of the song is. And we can like build off of that. And then sometimes it's just a blank brief with a budget and I'll just listen to the song a bunch and uh, either a line in the song will like kind of like make me have an idea and then I'll build off of that or just mm-hmm. the song in general. I'll hear it and like automatically kind of know what I want to do with it. Um, but it, it, it's, it, it's all different. And, yeah. and depends on the song. So sometimes I'll like listen to a song and just play it on repeat in my car for like two hours and just drive around. Or sometimes I'll just be on my computer and like looking at um, pictures and stuff. Mm. So I like look at like filmgrab.com and just other uh, screen grab sites for movies and kind of just like look at stuff and then hear the song and then look at the pictures. And if it kind of like clicks, I'll be like, oh, okay, this could be like a cool style that we could do. Mm -hmm. um but yeah it all it all depends um for sure most of the time it's it's pretty much just me uh coming up with shit on my own and then pitching the artists and sometimes they have input and they're like oh can we do this and add this and add this um but most of the time it's just like they're like okay yeah let's do that like whatever you guys want to do do you ever feel like sometimes some artists try and be a little too into the creative process where they're kind of fighting you on what you want to do and you kind of have a little back and forth or how do you kind of deal with that? Um, yeah, I've definitely had times like that. Um, at the end of the day, most of the time I take the artist side unless yeah. it's um, something that I really believe in. And even when you write treatments, it's really hard to uh, to visualize that. Like if you're reading it, it's really hard to visualize exact and, and just to like put down into words exactly what I like uh, want to do. So sometimes if uh, an artist has like a problem with a treatment, they'll call me and I'll kind of like explain it to them and they'll be like, okay, yeah, that's cool. But um, yeah, sometimes artists, it, it's, it's good to be involved, but it's also like, um, you kind of like got to let the artist work. So like you got to consider me an artist and let me do my thing. And obviously I'm going to hear your input and take it into consideration. But if there's an idea where I'm like, yeah, I like, I, this is what I do for a living. Like I know that this most of the time they're, they're pretty cool, but there's some artists that are just like, just, they're just not all there and they're just like oh let's do this or let's do this what about this and this and this and i'm like bro like nah, this shit does not work like that yeah for sure but it's it, it's it's good to have a uh, artist input um sometimes just because i mean the, at the end of the day it's it's their video so i want mm-hmm. them to like get something that they want rather than it be about me and be like nah like this is my idea like i'm not doing anything about it like it, it, it's, it's their video they're paying you for a service so you gotta give them what they want yeah definitely yeah and i definitely think there is a point where it is a collaborative process as well so sometimes that input does is really helpful and maybe sparked an idea that you haven't thought of so for sure. yeah 
but yeah cool yeah i got some questions from some people so we could breeze through a handful of those let's see um let's see what some people said someone kind of uh bape z 69 z is uh basically asking like how long is it of a process to kind of like make a music video kind of from pre-production to shooting to editing how long do you usually spend in each of those stages that that honestly like it varies every single video so there's some where we'll have two days of pre-production and pre-production as in the sense of all right we found a location uh we we got all the stuff together we got all the gear together um but then on like bigger shoots like on uh roxanne i had uh i did my first like tech scout where we had like the pretty much all the like super important people of each department come and like look at the location and kind of like talk exactly what everything needs to be done and then we were always on conference calls and mm-hmm. the, the bigger stuff and uh certain labels are, are are a lot more involved in like pre-production and like want to know exactly what's going on and exactly like how it's going to happen and then some are more like oh yeah we trust you so that'll get that that kind of like eliminates pre-production but normally we shoot uh it, it's normal 10 to 12 hour days uh the rock sand shoot was a 19 hour day and then the next day we shot for four hours at the uh at this like little house party thing mm-hmm. uh but yeah normally it takes one day to shoot and then editing it all varies too yeah. so uh there's been some like a uh, little skies and gnar uh, for Grave, the zombie video we did. We yeah. shot that on the 28th and released it on the 30th. Wow. Yeah, because they wanted to drop it right before Halloween. So Yeah, for sure. Um, there's some where it's like super tight, but normally um, a a normal like edit post schedule, I can do stuff in like about a week, at least a base edit. Um, but two weeks is like a normal turnaround where I can be like, all right, I got everything down. I like changed everything. Cause my, my editing process is a lot of just rewatching. It's just like yeah. editing and then just rewatching, rewatching, and then just kind of like getting that rhythm mm-hmm. where if anything, like kind of like throws you off that rhythm, rhythm, you can be like, okay, I need to change this or replace yeah. this and, and do this. But yeah, it, it all depends, but I would say a normal, I would say two weeks is like a normal like yeah. production shoot and turnaround time. For sure. What's something that not everyone knows when getting into this industry? Uh, something that normal people wouldn't expect uh, to know about music video directors. Something they might have to do, or something they um, know about that job. Uh, that so they do. When I first started doing uh, label stuff, treatments were a new thing. Like I had never written a treatment before. Um, so that, that was definitely like a thing that I, I didn't really know much about. Um, but I basically, I saw like some of my friends that wrote treatments and then I saw like uh, just research online, like how to write a treatment. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was one thing I didn't know. Another thing, especially if you're a young director getting into um, Cause this still happens to me today, uh, but getting into uh, the industry for the first time, labels are gonna try to take advantage of you. Labels, video commissioners, there, there's re- there's some that are really cool, and that that really like will treat you well. But at the end of the day, like it's their job to save as much money as possible. Mm-hmm. So they'll they'll do some some messed up stuff like offer you like a really low amount when the budget is higher just because they don't really like trust that you can handle that much money Mm -hmm. um or they'll do stuff where i mean it's pretty much just you got to put your that's that's the putting your foot down on certain stuff like certain stuff you can be like oh yeah i need to work with this artist so i'll kind of just like take the l and let them kind of like do that but eventually as you like build your stuff up you kind of have to like put your foot down and be like nah like i'm not doing that because there's so many times where there's some labels that are really really cool to me and then there's some that'll like hit me up 
as like a last resort. Like, yo, I got a $5,000 video. Treatment needs to be in tonight. We're shooting tomorrow. And I'm like, bro, like, no. Yeah. I used to be like, oh, yeah, I'll do that like any day. But now I'm like, bro, like, you got to like give me something else because I know what you're doing now. Yeah. At first, I was like, oh, my God, $5,000 like for an artist like this artist, blah, blah, blah. I'll do that all day. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, it's all just that's definitely one thing that I didn't expect um, coming into it. I kind of like knew that some ind- uh, some labels were shitty, but um, I think it, it now it's it's at the point where it's it's not as bad as it was when I first started. Mm-hmm. They're kind of starting, especially after the Roxanne shit. People um, were like, "Oh yeah, we can't offer them like yeah. two thousand dollars for a video now." Like for sure, it's definitely one of those more respect things and mm-hmm. and kinda- honest yeah it, especially after i did that there was just so many people that i kind of butted heads with um in the industry before like um label people and then as soon as i did that they were like oh like if you ever need any help blah blah blah. i'm like bro you give me the most problems and like yeah. now you're hitting me up because i did a bigger video like yeah it's just a lot of uh you got to just recognize who's actually genuine and who's not and um i feel like i can read people pretty well Mm -hmm. um but it's it's just tough when you're talking to labels because most of the time it's through an email and you never even see a face so like you do all this work for a video and send it in and then they're like oh like we need this changed and uh we don't like this part or this part and this part before even sending it to the uh the artist so a lot of times i would just like go over top of the label and just send it to the artist directly. And he's like, yeah, I fuck with this. And then as long as that, that's the main thing that um, when you get into this stuff, like you can be friends with the label people, but the main thing is you have to have a good relationship with the artist Cause that'll make your life 10 times easier mm-hmm. with changes and with edits and with just like ideas in general. Cause if you're like, yo, I talk to them, they fuck with it. The label's like, okay, yeah. It's yeah. it's what it's what they want, and a lot of times, um, just stuff gets lost in translation when it goes through a label, and then the label kind of like edits it down, and like, mm-hmm. oh, I don't, I don't like this part, but that could be a part that the artist really likes. So for sure, the it's just communication mm-hmm. is the main thing because there's been people where I've butted heads with on email, and then when I finally met them, I was like, yeah, like we're cool, like yeah. blah blah blah. It's just. I don't know. It's still all just a uh, a learning process. For sure. No, I definitely, no, I definitely think that's some good advice for people not knowing what they're getting into when they want. They definitely are like, oh, I want to be on the next level of, you know, becoming, you know, kind of that videographer stage to getting into like being more of a director and getting into these label videos and whatnot, not knowing some of the stuff that can go into it. Yeah. And also even with like, because when I – first started doing like bigger videos i was like oh i'm gonna be fucking rich as shit like i'm gonna make so much money and it's really not like that like i i'm making decent money now but when i first like all last year and the year before that when i was first getting into it it's like like say i would do a thirty thousand dollar video or a fifteen thousand dollar video i would normally make like maybe two thousand twenty five hundred um and it would be like two weeks of work and then sometimes you wouldn't get paid until like a month after because they do like net 30 or net 60 so like you can do like four jobs and work so much and not get any money off of it until like two months later and then you just get a huge bag at once so that that was another thing it's just i was doing bigger videos and then i was still broke and i'd be like damn i have to do like a 500 hundred dollar video for my friend just to make rent and uh that that was one thing that i didn't realize and I, just being in, uh, in la and just having more expenses and like having to pay for a house and, and pretty much like everything by myself yeah um, i think definitely. that's what kind of gets people stuck in that like run and gun video uh stage is because you can you can charge anywhere from 200 to eight hundred thousand dollars for some of these run and gun videos you know or yeah. even just making $500, but how much work is that? That's 
two to three days of work at most, you know? So, I mean, that comes a lot quicker. So I feel like once people get to the stage, because I definitely noticed that when I started doing a few bigger budget videos is, or just even getting a small budgets from labels is you make a lot less than you would sometimes doing that. Um, so yeah, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, it's all, it's all just like, because there's some where it's like, I would make the same amount on like a run and gun $5,000 video than I would on like a $50,000 video. Mm -hmm. Be like me doing all the work. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's all just pretty much what you want to do. Cause there was never like even the $500 videos. It wasn't like, Oh, I like, I'm just going to finesse this dude out of 500 bucks. It was yeah. like my normal price is like 2,500, but this dude's like, just as broken as me i'm not gonna charge him 2500 sure, yeah he doesn't have that like that's like a used car if you really think about it like this guy you're giving this money like 2500 dollars or thousands of dollars just to have a video on youtube and that could not do anything so it's yeah. like you waste all that money so i i definitely try to especially for like lower artists not lower artists but just like not as known artists that don't have as much money i'm not gonna yeah like upcharge them because even like doing a video with me isn't gonna like blow you up it's not no, like yeah. i have like a cole bennett channel or like a, a big following where i can like break artists and stuff like that so i i definitely just try to keep it on like a most human level as possible where like you understand the situation they're into and you don't want to like upcharge them and take all their money just so you can make rent like it's it's all a, a relationship thing and just knowing uh your worth and knowing what to charge certain people for sure no yeah i definitely like that um i think that's a good way to go about it so are you kind of done with the running gun video stage now and just trying to continue to do bigger and bigger videos or will you still work and do a running gun video if you see an upcoming artist that you really believe in uh i would I, i'm probably gonna always do running gun um, if it's a song that I like and if it's an artist that I believe in, um, yeah, I'll even, cause I, I want to get to the point where, um, I do big videos and I just stack my bread up. And if I find an artist that has a really good song, I could put my money into it mm -hmm. and get all this like good gear and give them a super professional video for basically free just because I want to help this artist out and I want to create something cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's the point where I'm trying to get at where I'll always help out um, new talent because you never know who's gonna blow and mm -hmm. you never know what like a favor like will do. Like if you do like imagine you do this video for two hundred bucks and then that artist is like the number one artist the next year and he remembers like yo that dude helped me out like exactly. when I had nothing he believed in me he helped me out so it's all just um. Yeah, it's all it's it, it it's it's super tough it's it's really hard to just explain like it's all just like a feeling thing like mm -hmm. where um if if it's in your gut and you believe that you should do it then do it and if you have like a gut feeling where you're like nah, I, sh I shouldn't be worrying about this then then follow that but it's all it's all kind of up in the air cool well yeah i think we covered a lot um is there anything that people should be looking out for or should they go follow you on instagram or do you have any thing you want to plug coming up in the future um i don't think there's anything right now that i'm allowed to talk about but there's definitely some big stuff in the works um i'm talking about maybe doing some vhs stuff like printing my uh videos onto vhs I have to talk to labels about um yeah I saw you working on that that looks sick yeah so I've talked to labels about possibly selling um those tapes because technically they own that so I can't just like sell them yeah for no reason but uh right now yeah I'm just like making a bunch of VHS tapes so I have like a collection of all my videos yeah. um and just learning like different analog editing styles and pretty much like just staying in and trying to like hone my craft in while this quarantine stuff is going on for sure that's dope cool yeah um so people could follow you on instagram to stay tuned with all that stuff put that yeah. down below cool is there any other advice or anything you want to tell um people who want kids who want to 
level up their directing game in music videos? Um, I would just say just always work. Do what you want to do. Don't be afraid to fail. Um, and try to create something you haven't seen before. That's the main thing because so many people try to recreate like, oh, I saw this done, so I want to like redo it and kind of uh, make it my own. And that's good sometimes, but I feel like the real like videos that pop are just like ideas that you come up with on your own and that and stuff that you haven't seen before in, in videos rather than replicating like, oh, this video is cool, so let's do something similar to that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, just keep working. Don't be afraid to work for free. Don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to be broke because all that shit is going to happen with this. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Cool. Thanks, man. I appreciate you being on. Uh, no problem, bro.